Good morning. Are you weak and heavy laden, cumbered with the load of care? We're going to be speaking from Luke 13, verse 31 through 35. I'm going to read that far. I don't think we're going to make it. We'll get through part of it today, maybe. I'm going to be talking about being steadfast. The same day there came certain of the Pharisees, saying unto him, Get thee out, and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings and ye would not behold your house is left unto you desolate and verily I say unto you you shall not see me until the time come when you say blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord let us pray Father in heaven, you know all things. I pray that you open up our understanding. Give us hearts to hear, the will to respond, and the desire to serve you in these tumultuous days in which we live. Give us clarity. Bind our enemy, Satan. And Lord, grant the freedom to preach your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Are you staying on task? That's a question I open up with today to preface this sermon. Are you staying on task? Are you being steadfast in the Lord? In a world where people are, are concerned, they're confused, <clears throat> a world that's been turned upside down, with concerns like inflation, war, political corruption, turmoil, chaos, confusion, anxiety, stress, and worry, are you remaining steadfast? That's an important matter we're going to speak about today. Because in the middle of everything that's going on, all of the confusion, all the chaos, all the turmoil, the political corruption, everything that we can know and see, God has given us all a mission. He's given us an objective to accomplish. We're going to see today that Jesus would not be turned aside from the objective that he was given to accomplish. And I know a lot of people will argue this point. They'll say, they'll make statements, well, he's God. Very true. Praise the Lord, he is God. But if we call ourselves Christian, that means we follow Christ. So uh, he is God. He is the son of God. He is man. He 
is the one who set the example we are to follow. You know, and before we ever get into the text, <clears throat> there are several points I want to bring out. Jesus faced a lot of obstacles. We'll talk about that in a moment, but just kind of keep that in your mind. Jesus faced a lot of obstacles, more so than we ever will. But I'm going to get into that a little later. You know, when we think about all of the stuff that can distract us from serving God, that can distract us from fulfilling the mission we've been called to perform, we have to recognize that none of it surprises God. Not a bit. People are concerned about inflation. Well, God has written in his holy word, Zephaniah 118, that one day gold and silver is going to be useless. God has written in his holy word that one day there's going to be a cashless society, a one world economy. You find those references in Zephaniah 118, Revelation 13, verse 16 through 18. But people are concerned about inflation. War. Matthew 24, verse 6 and 7 said there will be war. There will be rumors of war. Kingdom rising up against kingdom, nation against nation. Political corruption. Well, this is a good one. <laughs> Political corruption. What can I say? Well, this is what I'm going to say. <laughs> Daniel chapter 4 verse 17 tells us in no... With no apology here, get this. He tells us that God raises up the most base of people, the worst. And he puts them in positions of high authority. You'd say, well, why in the world would he do that? Well, there's a simple answer. Government cannot save us. Amen. Government's not savior. God is. God is. Political corruption. You know, Jeremiah 18, verse 7 through 10 says it's God who raises nations and destroys them. None of this surprises God. None of it. People are talking about Russia. We ought to be. We ought to be concerned about Russia and what's going on. You want to know why we ought to be concerned about Russia and what's going on? I, I taught about this a couple weeks in our small group. But Ezekiel 38 talks about Russia. Gog and Magog, check it out. And, and, and how in the latter days, by the way, it's talking about what will happen during the Great Tribulation. Believe it or not, we're not there yet. Yeah, because if we were there, we missed the boat. <laughs> Reality is, Russia is spoken of in Ezekiel 38 and 39, Gog and Magog, Meshach, Tubal. I, I taught that a couple weeks ago in our small group. It's not a surprise to God, not at all. When we think about turmoil, chaos, confusion, stress, anxiety, worry, 
God has a remedy. The remedy is found in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing. With all prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And he will give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. Even in these times of turmoil, chaos, and confusion, worry, doubt, and stress. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Will. I needed that. It can be lonely up here. <laughs> you know, this peace that surpasses all understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ. That's where we need to have our hearts and minds. In Christ. And you know, Jesus knows about worry and fear and doubt. He tells us in Romans 14, 23, that anything is not of faith is sin. So we struggle, don't we? We struggle. But in the midst of it all, we must be steadfast in Christ. Psalm chapter 11, verse 3, asks a very interesting question. When the foundations be destroyed, what should the righteous do? That's Psalm 11, 3. Verse 4 answers it. The Lord is still on his throne. We need to look to the Lord. There's the answer. But I fear that many people are highly distracted by everything that's going on. Should we not be concerned? Of course we should be concerned. But our concern should drive us to Christ. Our concern should drive us to the fact that we have to know and understanding and acknowledge that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the answer that everybody needs. Amen. Unequivocal here. It's the answer that everybody needs. You know, so we are Christians. I pray that everybody here is born again. If you're born again, you're Christian. To be Christian means to follow Christ and to follow the example of Christ. We're going to see in the text today that Jesus was very steadfast to the mission he had been given. And as we're speaking about that, I want us all to think about what is the mission we've been given. What is the mission we've been given to fulfill? And, you know, I want to break it down in the most simplest form. Among all the different callings that God gives his people, there is one in particular that is given to all believers. Go ye into the world and make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. Regardless of individual calling upon each life, that's what we've all been given to do. So think about that. I want you to notice that in our text today, Jesus received a death threat from someone identified as Herod. But I want to back up from that point and fill in a lot of things we need to know about the Messiah. One, Satan hates him. People who follow Satan hate him. 
And throughout history, people have tried to murder Christ. So this death threat is like nothing new. For instance, when Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea, we read in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, that Herod the Great sent soldiers to Bethlehem to murder Christ because Herod the Great was paranoid. He had been told that the king of the Jews had been born and the wise men asked where and the reply was in Bethlehem. Herod told those men go find him so that you could come back and tell me where he is so that I could come worship him. Herod had no intention of worshiping Christ. He wanted him dead. Herod the Great was the patriarch of the Herodian dynasty. He was not a Jew. He was descended from Esau. He ruled from 37 B.C. to the time of the birth of Christ. He's the one that was famous for refurbishing the temple in Jerusalem and expanding it. And he was known to be extremely paranoid. He murdered members of his own family because he thought they were a threat to the throne. And so he attempted to murder Christ because he thought he was a threat to the throne. And here's the point. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, we find out very succinctly that Herod the Great was used by Satan. It was Satan who desired to destroy the Son of God. He's the one that put it into the heart of Herod the Great to murder the Christ. And we shouldn't be surprised by any of this. Clear back in Genesis 3.15, it was prophesied that the seed of the woman would crush the head of Satan. Well, Satan knew who the seed of the woman was. He knew it was Christ. He wanted to be destroyed. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 through 13. Satan tried to tempt Christ, which is absolutely ridiculous. But he tried to tempt Christ. The problem is that Jesus is impeccable. That's a word to remember. It means he's incapable of sin. But Satan was bold enough to try to tempt Christ to sin for a reason. Because if he could have gotten Christ to sin... Jesus could not have been the prophesied sacrifice that spells doom for the devil. That attempt failed. 1 John 3, 8. The Son of God was revealed for a purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And I want everybody to understand this too. Even prior to the birth of Christ, Satan tried to destroy him. You got to know this. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, fallen angels cohabited with women, produced an unnatural race known as the Nephilim meaning the mighty fallen ones. And the world became full of violence. So violent, so corrupt, that God saw fit to destroy the entire world. Except Noah, his three sons, 
his wife, and his three sons' wives. Eight people. Satan tried to destroy the messianic line of Christ. But Noah had a son named Shem. And in Shem, we find in Genesis 11, verse 10 through 32, from Shem came Abraham. And Abraham was given the promise by God that through his seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Prophesying that through Abraham would come Messiah. In 2 Samuel 7, 16, God promised King David that an heir of his would receive an everlasting dominion without end. Well, Satan tried to destroy the lineage of David. How so? In 2 Chronicles 21, Satan used the marriage between the daughter of King Ahab and the son of King Jehoshaphat to produce a daughter that was so evil she killed the royal heirs, all of them. This marriage, this alliance between the northern kingdom of Israel run by Ahab and Jezebel, the southern kingdom of Judah run by Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat's son Joram and his wife Adaliah. Adaliah murdered all the royal heirs of David's line except one. He protected Joash. In Jeremiah 22, verse 28 through 32, King Jeconiah was brought to ruin, and all of his heirs became disqualified from serving as king. In Ezekiel 21, verse 25 through 27, God told King Zedekiah, Remove the diadem, take off the crown. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it unto him. That phrase, until he comes whose right it is, draws us back to Genesis 49.10 a prophecy given by Jacob to the tribe of Judah. This is what it says. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. The word Shiloh means the one to whom it belongs. A direct reference to Jesus Christ the one to whom that scepter of rulership belongs. And finally, in Jeremiah 23, verse 5 and 6, reveals that the king who would inhabit the throne of David will be none other than the Lord, our righteousness. God himself, God in the flesh, direct reference to Christ. I want everybody to know as well, not only did Satan try to destroy the messianic line of Christ before he was ever born, not only did Satan try to destroy Jesus when he was born, but Satan tried to destroy him after he was born and during the time of his ministry, prior to the time he was destined to die at Calvary. You say, what's the deal? Well, Satan wanted to stop Calvary from happening. 
That spelled his doom. It spelled our redemption. Luke 4, verse 18 through 30. Jesus preaching in the synagogue of Nazareth, place where he grew up, place where people knew him, the place where people knew his family. They didn't like his message. They led him out of the synagogue and took him out to the brow of the hill and tried to push him over the cliff. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. That attempt failed. John eight fifty nine, when preaching in Jerusalem, they tried to stone him to death. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. That attempt failed. In John 7, 1, Jewish leadership sought to kill him. They plotted his death, but that plot failed. John 7, 32, the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him, but they came back empty-handed. John 11, verse 47 through 53, Caiaphas, the high priest, with the chief priests and the Pharisees sought to murder Jesus because he was a threat to their position of power and authority. They were envious of him. You know, in the beginning, Pontius Pilate wanted to release Christ. But he was put in an awkward position. I'm not exonerating him. He came to the place where he recognized that if he didn't have Christ murdered, there would be a revolt on his hands. He didn't want that. So in Matthew 27, verse 24 and 25, Pilate washed his hands of the whole matter. We see the Jew and Gentile stood against Christ. They took counsel one with another. This is written, by the way, prophetically in Psalm chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, where it says, Why do the heathen rage? The heathen, the Romans. And the people imagine the vain thing. The people, the Jewish people. The kings of the earth set themselves. Herod the Great. Herod Antipas. They set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Pilate, Caiaphas, the high priest, Sanhedrin council. They took counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ. It's prophesied. It's prophesied. God knew it would happen. It was not unusual for Christ to face obstacles in his ministry. Amen? Not unusual at all. But Jesus knew his mission. He knew he was sent to this earth to destroy the works of Satan. He knew that he had to die on the cross of Calvary but here the Pharisees come to him with yet another death threat. And it's a threat from another member of the family of Herod the Great. Verse 31. The same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. The same day is important to note. It means the same day that Jesus was teaching about the need to strive to enter into the narrow gate. That day that he was teaching that you must agonize to enter in because there's so many obstacles. 
he was teaching that the majority of the Jewish people were, were going to be thrust out of the kingdom. He was teaching the Gentiles will enter the kingdom. He'd been telling them that the door of salvation would soon be closed. He had been teaching that it had been three years that he'd been ministering to the Jewish people and still that fig tree that represents Israel bore no fruit. And it would soon be cut down. He was teaching, in other words, that today is the accepted day. Now is the day of salvation. Time was running out. On that same day, the Pharisees come to Jesus to say, Get thee out, depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. I want to make something very clear here. They were not warning Christ to seek safety. They hated him. And we're going to get into that. This threat came from another Herod who was known as Herod Antipas. He ruled Galilee, the northern part of Israel. And he ruled an area over on the other side of the Jordan River, on the east side of the Jordan River known as Perea. He was one of the sons of Herod the Great. He was the Herod that John the Baptist preached against because this Herod married his brother Philip's wife. This is the Herod that had John executed. That Herod. This is the Herod, according to Luke 9, verse 7 through 9, that heard about Jesus, he thought perhaps... John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. The next time that we see in Scripture that Herod encounters Christ, that Christ encounters Herod, will be at his trial uh, before he's crucified. In that trial, you can see in Luke chapter 23, verse 8 through 10, Herod hoped to see Jesus perform a miracle. Says he'd heard many things about Christ. Says that he questioned him with many words, but Christ answered him nothing. The chief priests, the scribes, stood around and accused Christ. But Christ answered Herod nothing. He's the only person that we can see in Scripture that Jesus did not answer. In verse 11 and 12 of Luke 23, Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. He had contempt for Christ. Herod Antipas was known as being crafty, as being deceitful. And this is very important. Jewish leaders hated him. Herod had built his capital city of Tiberias over a Jewish cemetery. He set up idols. And he was such a bad leader that eventually he was banished by Rome. But on this occasion, the Pharisees are emissaries of Herod Antipas. They want to silence Jesus. Both of them do. So when we see this threat, get out of here, because Herod wants to kill you, was most likely because Jesus was in the area of Perea, east of the Jordan River. We know he ministered there. That was Herod's jurisdiction. And I believe that the Pharisees 
wanted Jesus to get out of there and go down to Jerusalem, then he would be under the jurisdiction of the Sanhedrin Council. For certain, they weren't concerned about Christ's safety. I want you to notice how this latest death threat does nothing to deter Christ from his mission. Verse 32. And he said unto them, Go ye, and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils and do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. He refers to Herod as a fox because it means someone who is wily, deceptive, cunning, and crafty. Just like Satan. Just like Satan. Herod sent the Pharisees to try to intimidate Jesus. So I want you to notice Christ sends a message back with them. He tells Herod he will continue to do the work that he has been called to do regardless. And it's important to realize something here that's going on. It's important to recognize that political interests can often bring people together who otherwise have nothing in common. Herod and the Pharisees were opponents. The Herod represented Rome. Rome was the oppressor of the Jew. The Pharisees wanted Jewish independence from Rome. They didn't get along. Except in this case, because they had a common enemy. Herod also was known for working through a group of people called the Herodians. You can see the name Herod in there. The Herodians were Jewish people who advocated for the Roman dynasty of Herod. Think about that. That means that the Herodians didn't get along with the Pharisees either. Because the Pharisees wanted Jewish independence. The Herodians promoted the causes of the dynasty of Herod. But even though they were opposed to one another, in their attitude toward Christ, they were united in their hatred for him. They collaborated with one another. We see this in Mark 3, 6, when Jesus healed man that had a withered hand. The Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. The Herodians and the Pharisees united against Christ. Mark chapter 12, verse 13, regarding the issue of whether Jews should pay taxes to Rome. They sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. Here again, we see the Herodians, the Pharisees, teaming up against Jesus. Mark eight fifteen. Jesus knew of their alliance. He told the disciples, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Herodians, the leaven of Herod. The Herodians and the Pharisees, they hated one another. But when it came to conspiring against Christ, they collaborated. And here's the point. Jesus knew that he came to die. 
He knew it. He knew why he had been sent to this earth. He knew that he had come to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 53, which would destroy the works of Satan. Isaiah 53, 3 says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, get this, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. When you drop down to verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. He was made an offering for sin. So Satan, Herod, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish people, the Romans all wanted Christ dead. But Jesus was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. It pleased God to bruise him. No one could hand him over to be murdered except God. Satan tried to destroy him even before he was born, destroy him during his infancy through Herod the Great, tried to tempt Jesus to sin. But God gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus is the only propitiation for sin, the only acceptable sacrifice. It pleased God to bruise him. So we see here, Jesus is not concerned about Herod Antipas. He said, Behold, I cast out devils and do cures today and tomorrow. In the third day, I shall be perfected. When he says today, tomorrow, and the third day, Jesus is speaking about the sequence of time, events that will culminate in his death, burial, and resurrection, particularly that third day after he's crucified, how he would rise from the dead that divinely appointed day. For he came to minister and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus says, I will be perfected. He will be perfected. And that does not mean that he wasn't perfect already. God is perfect. The word is used in the sense that his goal will be accomplished. That's why he came to this earth. To give his life, sacrifice for sin. And to triumph over Satan through the resurrection. Herod threatened to kill him, but Jesus knew it wasn't his time to die. He says, I'm going to keep on doing the work I've been doing until that third day when I'm perfected, when his goal be accomplished. And we have to understand, according to John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, that Christ laid down his life of his own accord. In obedience to God the Father. 
John 10, verse 17 and 18, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. Notice, no man taketh it from me, not Herod, not the other Herod, not the Sanhedrin, not the Jewish people, not Pontius Pilate, not Joseph Caiaphas, no one. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Jesus says in verse 33, Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following. Then he makes an interesting observation that by this time was probably like a proverb in the area of Judaism because it had happened so many times. He says, For it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. It's ironic to understand this, but the prophets of God that were murdered were not murdered by foreign enemies. They were murdered by their own people. More specifically, they were murdered by their own Jewish leaders, usually in Jerusalem. And in this case, Jesus refers to himself as a prophet. Now, how does that coincide with being the Son of God, a prophet? Interesting. He says this because Moses foretold of the coming of the final prophet. You find that back in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 and 19. The prophet to whom all must give account that prophet. He says, for it cannot be that a prophet perish outside of Jerusalem. In the days of Christ, it was in Jerusalem where the Sanhedrin presided. It's where they deliberated and made decisions. It would be the Sanhedrin that sentenced them to death. There are other passages of Scripture, and I want you to be familiar with these. Other passages of Scripture where Jesus speaks about the prophets being mistreated and even killed. One of those passages of Scripture is Matthew 22, verse 2 through 6. Jesus, notice he's talking here about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. The king would be God the Father. The son would be Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he sent forth his servants. The servants would be the prophets to call them that were bidden to the wedding. They would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, prophets, more prophets, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are now ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, the prophets, and it treated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Forty years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Just as foretold. 
In Matthew 23, 37, there's another place that talks about the prophets. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. By the time of Christ, Jerusalem was known as the place where the prophets went to die. Isaiah the prophet, the one who wrote the book of Isaiah, was murdered in Jerusalem. He was sawn in two after he was placed into a hollow log. King Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, sawed him in two. Zechariah the prophet, a different Zechariah than the one who wrote the book of Zechariah, he was the son of Jehoiada the priest. He was murdered by being stoned to death by King Joash. Uriah the prophet was murdered in Jerusalem by the sword of King Jehoiakim. Zechariah the prophet, the one who wrote the book of Zechariah, known as the son of Berechiah, he was murdered in Jerusalem between the temple and the altar. They were steadfast. They were steadfast in their mission. They were steadfast to the death. Hebrews 11.37 speaks of them. It says they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. It's ironic because Jerusalem was also known as the city of God. It was the place where the temple was located. But Jerusalem was known for killing the prophets of God. Jerusalem was the capital of Israel as it is today. It was the center of worship the city of God where they killed the prophets. Jesus said it cannot be that a prophet perish outside of Jerusalem. That was his destination. Jerusalem has an interesting history. It's also known as Mount Moriah. From Genesis 22, verse 14, we see that Abraham went to Mount Moriah to sacrifice his son Isaac to show his obedience unto God. It was at that place that God provided himself the fitting and acceptable sacrifice in place of his son. In response, Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, which means God will provide. In 2 Chronicles 3.1 is the place where Solomon built the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, Mount Moriah, where the Lord also appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite the place where God commanded King David to build an altar to stop the plague, the place where the temple of God stood. Jerusalem is also known as the city of peace, the city of peace, Jeru Shalom, city of peace. It's where God provided peace. The sinful man provided reconciliation to sinful man through the death of his son and his resurrection. Jerusalem was the place that Jesus had to die. It was the place where sacrifices were carried out in the temple, and he is the final sacrifice. Joseph Caiaphas, the high priest of Jerusalem, who was responsible, humanly speaking, for sentencing Christ to death, 
Here's some interesting things about what he said. This is found in John chapter 11, verse 49 through 52. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider ye that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. This spoke he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. We see that Jesus was steadfast in his mission. He knew what he was called to do. He knew why he came to this earth. He knew what his purpose was. And he didn't let all the possible distractions that surrounded him persuade him otherwise. So regardless of the chaos, the confusion surrounding us, we must look to Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sits on the right hand of God, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the clarity of your word. Thank you for the steadfast Christ that we serve. Help us, Lord, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, to be found faithful to be spreading the gospel, to be sharing the love of God with everyone we come into contact with. Help us to serve you. Help us to love you in the manner that Christ loves. And Lord, if there are any that are here today and do not know Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. May this be the day of their salvation. In Christ's name we ask. Amen.